Hey, welcome back. We're getting close to the end of James. We're in first chapter, not the end of James, the end of the first chapter. We're going to go through verses 21 through 25 tonight. We may finish depending on how long 21 through 25 takes us, but let's look at what James says in the text. In verse 21, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like a man who looks in the mirror, and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Wow. <clears throat> Notice what James is actually saying here in verse 21, skipping ahead just a little bit. The words that can save you. Let me put that as succinctly as I can. The word of God has the power to save us. You can't put it any clearer than that. Not that I can see anyway. No other power on earth has the power to save us. Yes, there are powers out there. There are things out there that can save the mortal body. And certainly you can slam on the brakes and not run over the little old lady in the crosswalk. Certainly you've saved her life, yes. However, you've saved her mortal life. Only the power of God, the life of Christ, and what he's done for us on the cross, the power, the word of God. You remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, right? The word, only the word of God has the power to save us. I don't see anything else that can save us for an eternity. The Word of God has the power to create anew. It causes us to be born again. Let's go back to 1 Peter in verse uh, uh, 1, 23 through 25. Problem with my accessories here. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. To us also, this is the word of God, the word of of God. It contains the way of salvation through Christ Jesus. And James uses the word sanctify. That means to be set apart for holy purposes. In the prayer that Jesus offered up in John 17, he spoke of sanctifying the sanctifying influence of God's word. Let's, let's take a look at John 17, verses 15 through 17 here. Jesus said, My prayer is not that you take them, he was talking about the disciples at this point, that you not take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. God's word sanctifies. It sets apart those he has called to be his, to move forward, taking his word and passing it on to others. For what is the gospel? Good news. You want to keep good news to yourself? No. You want to take it out. You want to share it with others. And so the word of God sets us apart for many things. One of those things is to share it with others. And it preserves. 
the elders of the early church, were admonished to keep the church pure. How? By the word of God. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 32, we're told, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you, each of you, day and night with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul, in his last meeting with the elders of Ephesus, telling them to keep the church pure with the word of God, which sanctifies. And there are benefits with the powerful word of God. But there are some things that we have to lay aside. And what are those? James says, well, we got to put aside moral filth, moral evil. Paul also gives us a description of those things in Colossians. In chapter 3, he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. We need to put aside things that drag us back into the world. We need to focus on those things that God finds pleasing for the word of God has to bear fruit in our lives, and the weed of sin has to be uprooted. The meaning is quite clear here in James's letter. Christians have to turn away not only from anger, as we discussed last week, but from evil and malice also. And only by doing this will we be able to claim the power of God's word, as described here in James. Going back to the venerable Bede, he says, you cannot do good unless you have cleansed yourself from evil first. Filthiness refers primarily to external things which corrupt our hands, whereas wickedness refers primarily to internal things which corrupt our souls. Both must be overcome if we are to do good. And we must do this with a proper attitude. We're supposed to humbly accept the word of God. But how many of us jump to the defensive once somebody points out one of our shortcomings? How many of us humbly accept anything? A humble and receptive attitude is essential if we want to get the most out of studying God's word. If we want the best meaning, we need to pray for God's wisdom. And if we're going to accept the wisdom God wants us to have, that means we need to be humble. We need to recognize that God's wisdom is much greater than our own pitiful resources. And if we want to remain humble, we need to remember two things. Number one, above all, no matter how much we think we know about the Bible and God's word, we are sinners above all. We're sinners also, even though we're trying to reach others who are sinners. And we too, number two, we too can be deceived just as easily. Look how many great people have fallen. You know, you, the list is, is endless. Look back in the 20th century on all those big-named individuals who fell from grace because they let power corrupt them, because they thought that they could handle all the fame, all the fortune, and it didn't work out that way. You know, Jim Baker, Jerry Falwell, David Koresh, Jim, you know, it, the list goes on and on and on. You cannot do it unless you have a humble heart and allow God to lead. We can't do it on our own. 
The only alternative to anger provoking situations is to let God lead. Let God have his way. Remember the sword of the spirit we talked about? That sword will cut the sin from our lives. We just have to let it work. And then the word will be implanted in our hearts. Because it's only the word, the word of God, that can truly save a soul. So we have to make sure that we take the word out of the pages of that Bible and put them into our hearts. We have to nurture it. We have to feed it. We have to carefully give it what it needs so that it'll grow, it'll blossom, and it'll move forward, not just in our life, but in the lives of those we touch. Since we were originally intended for close communion with God, this word has a definite, rightful place within us. It belongs in us. Just as we belong in the garden. And we'll get there again one day. Otherwise, we're no different than those who just pay lip service to anyone who, uh, say, for example, the Jews, you know, uh, it says to write the words on your doorposts, on your foreheads, on your arms. They're, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, have these things they call phylacteries. Yeah, don't ask me to spell it right now. But what it is is they have these leather bands that they wrap around their wrists. And they go all the way up their arms and on their hands. They have little leather boxes that have the Word of God in them. And on their foreheads, they have little boxes up here with bands that go around their head. And they have little scriptures rolled up and put inside them. Same thing on their doorposts to their houses. They have little boxes that have little scriptures rolled up and tucked inside them. They think that's what God meant by those verses in the Old Testament. But I don't think that's what it meant. I think what it means is that we need to have that word deep within our hearts. And we need to put it on our foreheads, which means we need to think about it. We need to act on it. That's why it's on our hands and on our forearms. Matthew 25, 40 says, whatever we've done for the least of the brothers of Christ, we've done for him. Well, if all we've done is roll up scriptures and put in a little box on our forehead, what have we done for our brothers and sisters? We'll get to that also a little bit later here in James. A distinguishing feature of, of those that are under the new covenant, as I'm discussing right now, we find in Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. And that's a long text. And I'm going to let you guys read that one on your own. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. Write that down. Look it up. But what it's talking about is that we have to have the Word of God written in our hearts, like I've just been discussing, so that it can be applied in our lives. James says, don't just hear the Word. Do it. Act on it. Hearing is an order to doing. The most attentive and frequent hearing of the Word of God does absolutely nothing unless we do something. We have to act on it. If we do not, we're no better than those who write scriptures in little pieces of paper and stick them in doorposts. It doesn't do anything. Augustine said, neither I nor any other preacher can see into your hearts. But God is looking, for nothing can be hidden from him. Think about that. Think about that. If you hear and do not do, what you're building will be a ruin. 
James tells us that we may use the word as we would a mirror. And just as a mirror shows the blemishes on our faces, the word shows blemishes on our souls. And if we flatter ourselves and don't look in that mirror, and don't pay attention to the blemishes, we're only deceiving ourselves. Only deceiving ourselves. God is not deceived. Satan is not deceived. Neither is anybody else that comes in contact with us. They're not deceived. You can try and hide it all you want, but people see right through. Self-deception only cheats oneself. And the desire to lie is right at the root of self-deception. But why would anybody want to believe a lie? Well, basically the truth hurts, right? We don't want to hurt somebody. We tell them a little white lie. And it's easy to see this in others. Very hard to discern in oneself. Self-deception, ignorance, conceit, they all go hand in hand. And sometimes it's hard because we really don't want to hurt someone. And then it becomes a pattern. We must be sure we don't rationalize these things by saying that we're not affected by them. Because we are. James also tells us that the true description of a man who looks in a mirror and straight away forgets what he looks like is one who hears the word and doesn't act on it. Yeah. Notice that he constantly comes back to acting on the word. We need to make sure we pay attention to acting on the word. True blessedness of the word does not come by looking into the perfect law, but by continuing in it, by being a doer. James actually defined this as a law that grants the Christian freedom from self-interest and immorality, which allowed him to grow into the person that God intended him to be, or her. And so we have to work at it. We have to practice it constantly at work, at leisure. We always have to have it in front of us and make it a constant rule no matter what we are doing. We must make sure that the deeds that we are now performing are accompanied by a converted heart. And the blessedness doesn't lie in the knowing of the word, but in the doing of the word. How many people can quote the Bible? You know a lot of people that can? How many people can actually do the Bible. Think about that. Let's take a look at the next two verses. Verses 26 and 27. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that our God accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Hmm. Guess there's enough time to finish the chapter tonight. Practicing religion. Practicing. Why do we practice? Well, practice involves doing something, right? This is clearly implied in the phrase we just looked at in this text, practice. We have to practice because we're never going to get perfect at it. Because no matter how hard we, we work at it, there's always something else to do. There's always something to do in the kingdom. Ooh, commercial break. 
there's always something to do in the kingdom. We've been posting scripture a day on the uh, CHCC Facebook page. This week, we're branching out into something new. One of our guys is setting up a YouTube page. So go on up and look for the CHCC YouTube page. There's not a lot of videos up there yet, but we're branching out. So always something to do. Uh, we're all pretty up there on the leadership team here at CHCC. We're scouring our congregation for a nice, savvy teenager to help us do all this kind of stuff. But we're getting there. We now have a YouTube page. You can su subscribe to it if you'd like to. Uh, if you need a link, you can IM me. Email me if you have that. I'll get you a link. Or you can just search YouTube for CHCC and start looking at videos that are up there. Our Easter service has already been posted. And I'm sure there's other things going up as I record this. So commercial break. Go look for the new stuff. Uh, doing stuff. Matthew 7, 21. Doing stuff. Jesus himself said, we have to do things. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. So what is the will of the Father? Well, we already had that. Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says you got to do stuff. You got to get out and be active in the kingdom, right? Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What he says is love your brother, love your sister, love God. If everybody loved like Jesus said, I would have never had a career because we wouldn't have had to have a military and I'd have had to find something else to do. So would a lot of my friends. And I hear people in the background going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another comment. I would have been retired by now. Yeah, I'm getting close. But Jesus says we have to do stuff. Need to work in the kingdom. James also says, Worship with a sharp tongue is a means of self-deception. Jesus never had a sharp tongue. The more one lashes out with their tongue, cutting and destroying, the more one powerfully he or she feels. Yeah, that's true. And pretty soon everybody trembles at the sound of their voice. And everybody wants to get away from them. But the person who has a detracting tongue never has and cannot have a truly humble and gracious heart. Not until that tongue gets tamed. And this is the greatest deception of all. Because that person is going to set themselves up as a God, passing judgment, passing sentence on their fellow man. Rash and angry words have no place in the life of a Christian. A person whose religion is like this is deceived because religion, that type of religion, really has no power over ethical behavior. It is a faith that is so useless before God that it is considered to be no faith at all. If we're not doers, we're deceiving ourselves. And again, it's only us that we're deceiving. We're not deceiving God. We're not deceiving Satan. In fact, Satan loves it when we do stuff like that. And we're certainly not fooling our others, especially not our children. Be surprised how smart our children are. They look right through us. And God did not intend for our religion to consist of just going to church and sitting in the pew and listening to the sermon. No, God intended us to act like a family within church, to reach out to help others that needed assistance and to share the talents that he's gifted us with. Hermas, 
second century said, instead of fields, buy souls that are in trouble according to your ability. Look after widows and orphans. Do not neglect them. Spend your riches on these kinds of fields and houses. Wow, what a way to spend your money, right? And throughout the New Testament, there's much emphasis placed on doing good. Uh, Paul wrote about that. In Galatians 6.10, he said, Therefore, we have opportun as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those in the family of believers. He wrote to Titus to do good things. The author of Hebrews in 13.16 said, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And from the Apostle John in his first letter, third chapter, 17 and 18, he said, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or with tongue, but with actions and in truth. Actions and in truth. <clears throat> We have to get out there and make Christianity a personal religion, not something where we just sit in the church and wait for somebody to come by and tickle our ears with a feel-good sermon. No, we have to get out there and act like Christ. I know it's difficult in these days of the coronavirus, but that's what we have to do. Let's go to Chrysostom have a fondness for Chrysostom. I use a lot of his material in my background, in my research. But in uh, one of his katanas, he said, we can become more like God if we are merciful and compassionate. If we do not do these things, we have nothing at all to our credit. God does not say that if we fast, we shall be like him. Rather, he wants us to be merciful as he himself is. I desire mercy, he says, not sacrifice. And this personal religion is implied by the use of singular pronouns within the text that we've been studying. Anyone, his, himself, he, oneself. All throughout the text we've been studying, there are personal, singular pronouns. Okay, there's a place for corporate giving, yes. And there's a place for helping needy Christians, yes. And it's never intended to replace our individual and our personal responsibility, right? Somebody might think that giving on Sunday fulfills their responsibility for that, but no, no, no. Somebody might think that it fulfills their obligation to preach the gospel. No, you aren't supposed to preach the gospel unless you're actually a paid evangelist. You're supposed to live the gospel. Right? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, What you do, speak so loudly I cannot hear what you say. You're supposed to live the gospel. God has intended for corporate giving to meet only certain needs. He still expects us to fulfill our personal services to the poor, to the widows, to the orphans. We go back to Matthew 25, 40, constantly. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you have done for the least of these brothers of mine, you have done this for me. Okay? Yeah, touch the widows, touch the orphans. They're always there. There's always opportunities to help them. You have to live the gospel, and that's one way to do it. We need to have a pure religion. But if we're sinners, and that's affirmed in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we're sinners, how can we ever be pure 
faultless and unspotted. Well, James stresses the fact that we must not remove ourselves from the world. We have to live within it. And how can we do that? With intelligence, with forethought, keeping our lives pure and secure in the faith that we have developed by being in the word. James's idea of faith enters the surrounding culture, but remains free from the evil that is found there by remaining in the word, by being active in the gospel. The world is apt to spot and blemish the soul, and it's hard to live in it. But with God's help, with God's wisdom, it's possible. And James is telling us we can do that with a constant endeavor. Thank you for joining me. We have now concluded the first chapter of James. Next time we get together, we'll get started on chapter two. I hope you're enjoying it. Remember to check out both the CHCC Facebook and now brand new, starting in today, the CHCC YouTube page. We have lots of good stuff there. Can you join me in a prayer? Father, we just thank you for the word, for the way that has been preserved for us, for the way that it works within us and helps us to be the people that you would have us be. We thank you for watching over us during this time frame. And Lord, we just pray that as we move forward, you will continue to shower us with blessings. Father, there are individuals out there who have need of your loving, touching, healing hand. Pray now that you'll provide that healing, that loving touch. Be with us as we move forward into the next week, the remainder of this week. And thank you, Father, once again for Jesus. And it's through his most precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining. Have a blessed night.